All these years later, the fifth element is a sight for sore eyes, an instant cure for streaming option paralysis. But what makes Luc Besson's world so compelling? Whenever I see a food truck or street vendor in the real world, I think about the day when they'll just float up to my apartment window. When I'm in a traffic jam cab, I fantasize about Bruce Willis's strong shoulders plunging through traffic. It's out of this world aesthetic, a visual standard of thick, brown barbecue sauce oozing style from its forehead. A lurid European romance entangled with techno metropolitan brutalism. We can already hear the smarties in the back of the room giving shout outs to cartoonist Jean-Claude Mezier. And while we culture snobs subscribe to this movie being a vulgar ripoff of Mobius and Jodorowsky's graphic novel, The Incal, the production design is not the reason we keep coming back. The answer is its costume design. It's the costumes. All at once, they enhance the story, elevate each scene, and propel the film's world building to inestimably fantastic levels. Oh! To this effect, I would say that The Fifth Element is less of director Luc Besson's movie as it is costume designer and fashion mogul Jean-Paul Gaultier's. So how does costume design change our world? To understand this, let's look at the relationship between costume designers, real world fashion, and The Fifth Element. This is The Breakdown. Typically, costume design brings an added layer to the immersive storytelling experience of a movie, and this is especially true for period films. One obvious example, Gone with the Wind, has costumes accurately depict Scarlet's fall from grace. Making her own clothes serves as a nice metaphor for how she redefines herself in the post-Civil War world. Everything from texture to material to color produces an emotional response to a character. Even more subtle notions, like the quality of lines on a character's shirt, as seen in Good Will Hunting, can convey emotional information about Will's journey, whether the audience is aware of it or not. Jean-Paul Gaultier was already pretty famous in the fashion world by the time fellow Frenchie Besson asked him to bring his kooky and kinky sensibilities to the film's wardrobe department in the mid-90s. Gaultier had just begun to penetrate the mainstream a few years prior when he made Madonna's cone bra, but The Fifth Element was going to introduce his work to a much wider audience, and he was going to make the most of it. During production, the House of Gaultier produced more than 1,000 costumes for The Fifth Element. Every member of the cast, from the big names to the extras in the crowd shots received the same Gautier signature details, fusing together punk, lingerie, and BDSM, while boldly redefining ideas about who we are and where we're going in our intergalactic future. Like all great costume design, the fifth element's garb reflects aspects of personality, setting, and theme, but more importantly speaks on behalf of who these characters are and what drives them. Lilu Dallas Multipass. Mila Jovovich's bandage costume and Bruce Willis's semi-backless tank top spiritually reflected the bondage style work Gautier had done for Madonna, but brought into the 23rd century with bright orange materials. Yeah. Lila, uh, multipesh, you know this multipesh. Lila Dallas, my wife, we're newlywed. Gary Oldman's character, Jean-Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg, wears an avant-garde version of the pinstripe mobster look from the 1930s, composed of vinyl and rubber materials. Bassan described this character as a dandy nouveau riche Hitler. Serving old-timey criminal meets futuristic fascist CEO realness, Zorg is a prime example of the fashionable collision of multiple cultures in the fifth element's world. My favorite. His look evokes comparisons to mafiosos as well as triad warlords, while his southern drawl suggests an altogether separate background. Bring me the priest. No discussion of the Fifth Element's costume is complete without talking about my favorite character in the whole movie. DJ Ruby Rod is an over-the-top, flamboyantly extravagant and hysterically effeminate character with a wardrobe to match. Ruby was originally supposed to be played by Prince until he allegedly turned down the job because the costumes were too feminine? From his dazzling intro clad in a leopard print one-piece with a wide gown-like collar, what was that? Chris Tucker steals every scene. Though he does embody some problematic tropes, his status as a chick magnet and sex god does push the boundaries of what that is supposed to look like. <laughs> the Fifth Element's costumes not only make the film's world feel alive, but have gone on to impact modern aesthetics in which boundaries are being continuously blurred, be they between traditional concepts of masculine and feminine, or styles like BDSM, lingerie, and work uniforms. Gautier's visionary design was not just sexy, gender-bendy, multicultural eye candy for blockbuster movie audiences, but proved to be a cultural touchstone for a whole generation of haute couture fashion designers. 
In the aftermath of Gautier's costumes, a feedback loop had been conjured in which designers were influenced by a film that was influenced by designer, and what Gautier originally scried as the fashion of the future in The Fifth Element actually manifested itself on the runways of Gautier's acolytes. While Hollywood's deployment of fashion houses was not unheralded before Gautier, we tip our hats to Gavinci's iconic little black dress for Breakfast at Tiffany's and Paco Roban's retro-futurism designs for Barbarella. Gautier's work on the Fifth Element deserves an iconic reverence in the pantheon of pop culture greats. Immediately after the film's release, British fashion designer Alexander McQueen's 1998 show featured clear homages to both The Fifth Element and Blade Runner. Machino's Jeremy Scott also frequently cites Gautier as an influence, which is obvious given the looks served at Machino's Fall Winter 2014 collection, which featured chic McDonald's cashiers, and his personal Fall Winter 2018 show, which directly referenced Lilu's costume in the movie. Widening the scope on this spectacle, an overarching question comes into focus. Is the fifth element the closest we've ever gotten to seeing what we'll look like in our intergalactic future? Science fiction and fashion have been in a long-standing symbiosis. Blade Runner's sci-fi noir style continues to inform haute couture. Balenciaga's summer 2019 collection had Matrix vibes, and Jun Takahashi's obsession with Kubrick's 2001 is undeniable. Before dismissing this parallel as nothing more than the means of making a cool-looking jacket, consider the ideologies at play. Science fiction asks, who are we and where are we going? Worlds are explored as a way to break through the limits and to defy the norms of current modern society. Sci-fi visionaries build worlds to painstaking detail, from the industrial design of cities to how people dress. At last. While the ideas in sci-fi make us ponder the bigger picture of existence, the visual aesthetics inform our modern fashion in the real world. Concepts of boundlessness and breakthrough are employed just as fervently in each discipline. Clothing designers are fueled by visions of how humans will dress in the seasons to come. Collections are often set within fictitious worlds where reality is bent and the modern way is cast off. This goes way beyond debating if plaid is the new black. Conventional rules of expression are broken in favor of a gaze towards the outer limits. Clothes transcend into commentary. The wearer makes an aspirational statement to the outside world, proclaiming who we are and where we are going. It's only a matter of time before we arrive at Gautier's fifth element moment, and this relationship folds back in on itself. David Fincher says, film is fashion, but often is the case in sci-fi, where film becomes fashion. What we see in The Fifth Element is the same thing we see in Haute Couture, an aspiration that has no function in the real world other than looking cool. Before dismissing this as an unbelievably shallow thesis, consider that you could describe paintings in the Louvre the same way. So, is The Fifth Element cinematic trash or an artwork defying analytic criticism? Subsequent sci-fi flicks like The Hunger Games and even the Star Wars prequels have obviously been marked by Gautier and Bizhan's work, with Day's review of The Hunger Games mentioning that the film is set somewhere between the bombastic camp of Luc Besson's Fifth Element and the apocalyptic existentialism of Cormac McCarthy's The Road. To have a film, especially one in the sci-fi genre, impact or predict real-world fashion is unprecedented. Nobody dresses like Han Solo or Gaius Baltar, unless it's at a convention. It's sad to say, but without the costume work of the House of Gautier, and the visual direction from comic artist Jean-Claude Mézière of Valerian and Loreline fame, The Fifth Element with its formulaic and problematic woman needs man to love her plot would have been hoisted into the pile of forgotten sci-fi failures. Instead, this cinematic whirlwind of color and design opened my eyes to the world of fashion and costuming in ways that would never have happened if it hadn't also featured spaceships and aliens. So. Thanks, you French weirdos. Thanks for watching, everyone. Always remember that whatever you're wearing now is going to look totally stupid in 10 years. This is The Breakdown.